Let's go to Mark 9, 14 to 29. As you can guess, I'm going to preach about prayer today. God is self-existent. God is self-existent. God is self-existent. God is self-existent. Exodus 3.14, God introduced himself as I am that I am. I am who I am, which is the meaning of self-existence. So God is self-existent because he's the only uncreated one. So when we say God is self-existent, we are saying he is the uncreated one. He is the only uncreated one, which means everyone else is created. God alone is uncreated. And he can do all things without the help of anyone. So he is the only one who can do all things without the help of anyone else. Uh, in Genesis 18.10, uh, when God promised uh, Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have a child at their old age, which was beyond um, the years of uh, bearing uh, children, um, God said, everything is possible for he who believes. Nothing is impossible with God. And that is repeated when Jesus said, everything is possible for him who believes. Do you believe that? That everything is possible in God. That nothing is impossible with God. Amen. Are you sure? With you, with me, many things are impossible. But with God, there is nothing impossible. That's what makes him the self-existing, uh, the uncreated God. So if we have faith in him, we acknowledge him to be the only self-existent God. We therefore long for him and his power, his help, his strength, his protection, his provision. Because no one is like God. God alone is the self-existent God. And therefore, he can do all things. And if I believe him, I have to acknowledge that I cannot do everything. In fact, there are more, more things that I cannot do than the things that I can do. Therefore, I need his help. So having faith in him means you confess your inabilities. You confess your weakness. You, you, you confess that you are incompetent, and it's okay. Um, when I went to visit Serbia many years ago for the first time, and I just remember Serbia as being part of Yugoslavia in the 2000, you know, in the 2000 um, uh, early uh, 2000. They had big conflict. It split into seven different, six or seven different countries. And Serbia, um, even though they had great culture in the past, it's it's a post-war state, and they're still struggling. Uh, perhaps one of the poorest countries in the EU now. Um, and visiting there, you know, they're mostly uh, it's an Orthodox country, and. Um, just talking to Christians there, uh, they told us that, you know, churches, many evangelical churches or whatever is called evangelical, born-again Christians, um, are, that these churches are filled with many women and especially older, and they have a hard time evangelizing to men. So then, you know, I said, well, you know, that's sort of like that uh, in our, con uh, you know, other countries too. But they were saying that um, for them, the struggle was for men to come to Jesus and confess that they are weak they are sinners, that they are failure. And this was very difficult, especially for the Serbs, because they have this sort of, as a culture, um, it's like machismo for the Latin or the Hispanic culture, but they have this very macho image as men. And uh, throughout the war, you know, this was um, how uh, they were able to, well, they were engaged in this uh, horrible ethnic cleansing with the Bosnians and all that. So they were saying that, it's really hard for them to bring their husbands and their brothers and men because it was hard for them to admit that they need God. So it kind of brought me to think about, you know, in certain cultural and historical contexts, you know, these things really hinder uh, people from accepting Christ. And accepting Christ, accepting God, involves your confession of your weakness. And it's okay to do that because no one's gonna, God's not going to look down at you and say, you're weak. Oh my God, you're weak? God's not going to be surprised. He's just going to say, of course you are. No, duh. How long did it take you to realize that? So having faith in God is to really acknowledge God alone is self-existing. God alone is un the uncreated one. I'm not. So if I have this faith, my life is then uh, is about putting effort to succeed by God's help. Say amen if you want to succeed this year. Amen. Succeed at anything and everything that you do. 
Amen. Whether it's academia in academics, whether it's in sports or uh, personal achievements like diet or, or health or um, your career, or family, everyone wants to succeed. <laughs> Amen. There's only one person now. So <laughs> Uh, it is February, and it's like m the resolution thing is already over, and gyms, all these gyms are empty because people, three days of working out, they've given up already. And it's like by the end of January, it's like, hey, you again? Yeah, hey, you again? You know, it's old. <laughs> so the commitment doesn't really last. But people still have this um, longing and expectation that this year is going to bring better, uh, better result and greater success. Because whatever happened last year was you know, had a failure, some sort of failed plans. Therefore, I want to succeed at my plans this year. So everyone does have some sort of plans to succeed. And it's OK as long as we do it by God's help. And that's someone who has faith. That is someone um, who tries to live by their faith uh, in their life. So again, it starts with confessing, realizing and confessing one's inabilities. And therefore, depending on, entirely depending on the help of God, to succeed. That's what faith life is. So, you know, secret to success, and especially as Americans, uh, we, we hear and read um, stories of people who have overcome their limits and pull them up by them, their own bootstraps and have made something of themselves from poverty to prosperity. We love to uh, hear about those stories, and that's what, you know, this country, America, has been built on that kind of dream and philosophy. And therefore, self-help books and, and, and stories are bestsellers. That's what we want to hear a lot of, because that's what we want for ourselves. So um, it is within everyone's desire to succeed. Um, yet, when you look at statistics, it's only very few people who succeed. Because if, you, um, if everyone succeeds, uh, I don't think the word success will exist. In some, uh, some ways, the concept of success uh, really uh, implies that there are only a few who make it, and the rest fall out of that. Rest uh, struggle with their failures. And it's because, as Jesus reminded us, the heart is willing, but the flesh is weak. So the heart wants to do so many things. The heart says, I'm going to run five miles today, five days a week, rain or shine. Oh, but it's snowstorm, ice storm. I'm not running. I'm not going to run until March or until April. I'll take a break. So the heart is willing, but the flesh is weak. So you tend to compromise, and then you suffer because of that. And this is why only very few people um, become successful. Um, and the older you get, the more mature you, you become, you come to know yourself. So Socrates says, know thyself. It's like when you're younger and you hear that, it's like, what's the big deal? Big deal with that statement, know thyself. And this old man, I have a grand, grand statement to make. I have this great finding from my life. Are you ready? Yes. Know thyself. <laughs> it's, it, it's like, what? But <laughs> the more you uh, live, I guess, the older you become, I really do hold on to those words. And I realize Socrates was a very wise man. Because <laughs> to know yourself, it takes a long time. So teenagers, for example, certainly don't know themselves. Even people in their 20s and 30s, they're still getting there. Perhaps when they reach 40, uh, in the 40s, they know themselves. That's, you know, so it takes a very long time for humans to know themselves. Um, knowing yourself means that you, you know your limits. So people say when they get older and they become elderly, they become very um, uh, timid and they lose confidence in themselves, not just physically, but every way, every a in every aspect of their life, they become very insecure. And it's because they know more about their limits than their uh, strengths. They know more about their weakness than their strength, their abilities. So it's very difficult to become successful in life. Um, not only that, you may consider yourself to be successful, but other people have to acknowledge you as successful. You may think that you're the king of the world, but people look at you and you're like, what, what world? You know, in your room, you're the king. In your house, you're the king. But you ain't nothing in the world. Right? So it has to go to, uh, uh, together uh, that your uh, self-perception um, 
and others' perception have to be congruent. They all have to agree that you are successful. So if you want to be successful in, uh, in, stu in, the, in studies, in academia, the scholars, the teachers, the people have to acknowledge you as successful academically. Uh, if you want to be successful financially in business world, the business people have to see you and say, you are a successful person. Like Bill Gates, everyone knows he's successful. Steve Jobs, he died, but everyone knows. He's like an idol. You know, he, wow, like Apple just celebrated, what, how many years? You know, of, of, uh, of its, uh, huh? Not that important, but anyway. So, <laughs> so, so it's, they just celebrated the invention, the, 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 the uh, innov innovative technology and, that has changed the world, and it really has, and what a success, right? So uh, these uh, people recognize them to be successful, and now we are in the uh, Winter Olympics, Sochi Olympics, so many stories that we've been hearing leading up to these games. Um, this is where these athletes shine, because they have battled against their weaknesses all their life, and battled against so many competitions and competitors, and made it to the top. Now, since they're made it, they made it to the top, they have to win the gold. You know, that's the measure of, uh, measurement of uh, success. Think about the pressure they have. And you know that these people did not start skating at the age of 15. <laughs> you, you can't say, Mom, I'm going to give up on studying. I'm going to go after figure skating. But you haven't even moved your legs all your life. Well, I want to do it. It's too late because your muscles, your, your bones, your body has become rigid, as we just read, <laughs> rigid, and it's not going to help you to do all those flips and turns that figure uh, skaters are supposed to do. So you hear about these stories where um, little boys and girls, uh, when they are found to have uh, talent, that they uh, start having uh, coaches at the age of five or even earlier, three. I mean, they're on the, in their skates at the age of three. I mean, to be a hockey player, and I, was, I just read a little bit about these two sisters who are hockey players. Sisters, hockey players, they're huge. So, I mean, to overcome the odds as female uh, skaters and hockey players and make it to the top to the Olympics is amazing. It's incredible. And they're twin sisters. Wow. It's just, you know, it's amazing. And I'm thinking, they must spend, the parents must have broke bank to, you know, to do it at the same time, to spend money on the both girls and support them. So you need to have talent that you're born with. And then, second, you need some sort of grooming and development of your talent. And third, money. You need a lot of money. So usually these people are not, they aren't necessarily rich, but they have to uh, go and take out money from their retirement plan and their savings, and they might have to live a very modest life uh, because they have to support their children. But it was, you know, the mom who quits her job, even the dad who quits his job, to travel with the kids, to go, you know, to, to shuttle them to, you know, from game to game, to competition. It's behind them are this amazing support that was always with them to, to make sure that they win, they, they succeed. So again, it's not talent enough. Because would you think that there's only few handful of skaters around the world who are talented? There are, much, there are many more uh, people with great talents. But not all of them have the help and the support they need to groom their talents and make it to the top. So in the sports, in, in uh, entertainment industry, you know the Grammys, the Oscars, whatever. These are all people. These are the people who make it to the top. And for them to get to the top, they had to battle against all kinds of competition. Likewise, so we see that to succeed, it's very difficult. And it's not enough with talent. It's not enough with your own abilities. But it also involves others' support. But it does, not, uh, it does not necessarily tell us to be discouraged just because we have not made to the Sochi games or that we have not made to, the, to Hollywood. But it's, it's a reminder as Christians, when we look at the Bible, we find the secret, the secret to success. The Bible spells out the secret to success. And the secret to success is the help of God, the help that comes only from God. Hallelujah. He, if he is on our back, if he is with us, then we can do all things. We can do all things in Christ. Do you believe that? Do you want to believe it? I can do all things in Christ. Hallelujah. Yes, we can. Can we say it together? Yes, we can. Those words come from, those optimistic words come from the Bible. Um, it's because in Psalm 121, verses 1 to 2, it says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains, to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Hallelujah. 
these are words uh, in the confession of King, uh, the King David as he knew that the hills were surrounding, that his enemies were surrounding, even his own son was coming after him and that his life was so vulnerable, so fragile, right under attack. He was so desperate. But as he looked to the hills, he made this confession. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord because the Lord is the maker of heaven and earth. He is the uncreated one. He is the self-existing God. Hallelujah. For God to reveal himself to be the help for all men, to be the strength and the source of strength for all, that he is the uncreated one, he revealed himself. He began to reveal himself through the creation. So he made all things in heaven and earth, and finally he made man. And when he, he made man from the dust of the ground... He formed man from dust, and that's how the flesh is formed. And among them, God chose one and breathed into him the breath of life. And the man became a living being. So when God breathed into the man, the man became a spiritual being, which means that he, his existence originates from God. So even though the flesh was formed from the dust of the ground, the one who made him was God. But now once God... Uh, God breathe in, breathes into this one man and makes the man a living being. He's now connected to God because his, orig uh, his origination is in God. God, from God came this life, this spirit. So the man became a spiritual being, a living being. And his name was Adam. And Adam lived in the Garden of Eden, which was an abundant place, with, which, uh, you know, we talked about lots of rivers uh, coming out from that garden, watering the, uh, the lands around there and making it all vibrant and flourishing and fruitful. That's where Adam and Eve later uh, showing up, both of them live. So they live in this abundant place. So because they had everything that they needed and they did not lack anything, they started to take for granted who made all things. And they started to uh, want more. Instead of being grateful and being uh, content, they wanted to be more. So you see there was a seed there already before the devil comes. You know, because of the flesh, the flesh is always tempted. And here's the deceiver coming at the right time and said, did God really say you cannot eat from the trees in the garden? And Eve said, no, just one tree, that tree at the center of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, if we eat of it, we will surely die. But the serpent said, no, you will not surely die. Instead, if you eat of it, you will be like God. <gasps> who is God? The uncreated one who does not need anyone's help. Suddenly it sounded good. And the fruit looked good, pleasing to the eye. So they took the forbidden fruit. But we know that they didn't become like God. Instead, they sinned against God. And sin means the separation from God. Therefore, their relationship with God was cut off. Namely, their conversation with God, Adam's conversation with God, Adam's ability to go before God, to speak to God, became broken, uh, became uh, cut off. So Adam became cut off. So we see that physically when God puts the flaming sword around the garden in Genesis 3.24, it signals the broken relationship between God and Adam, therefore all mankind. So the conversation between God and men becomes broken. There's, it's, it's drop call now. There is no more conversation, no more calling, no more speaking. The relationship is broken because of sin. But because God had the plan to reveal himself as the self-existing God, he called on Moses. When God called Moses, it was from the burning bush. From the burning bush, God said, Moses, Moses. Moses had been out in the uh, in, in the wilderness looking for his sheep because he was now humbly tending sheep. He who used to be a prince of Egypt was now on the run and therefore he became, uh, he got married and settled in the desert and he was living as a Hebrew, as a, past, uh, as a, um, as a shepherd, uh, living this quiet life. And suddenly he sees this bush burning but that was not consumed and he was so mesmerized and so taken back by this bush, he forgot where he was and he forgot what was going, why he was there. Then he heard the voice of the Lord saying, Moses, Moses. So from that moment, Moses' life changes because he was called by God. And not just that, God started to reveal himself as the self-existing God. So when God told Moses, what did God, what did, what did God tell Moses to do from the burning bush? Huh? Go, you certainly read that part, right? I got to look at the list of the Bible charts. Okay, so God told uh, Moses to go 
the famous words that MLK said, let my people go. Go and tell the Pharaoh to let my people go, right? So go and get, bring my people out because I have chosen them to be my people. Bring them out. And then Moses said, oh, I can't do it. But, and then finally, like, if they ask me who it is, sent me. What do I say? What's your name? Who are you? And God said, I am that I am. I am who I am. So I am who I am there is uh, the self-existing God. Let's go to Exodus 3. Just for your reference, let's look at that. The conversation between Moses and God. 3, from 3.13. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is. Yes. So I am has sent me to you. So his name is I am. So in English, it sounds really strange. Hi, my name is I am. Hello, my name is I am. I mean, who has a name like I am? No one has the name called I am, only God. So I am derives from the, um, the four character from the original text, the tetragrammaton of his name, which translates to I am that I am. Then from there came Yahweh or Jehovah. So God reveals himself as, so the meaning of Yahweh or Jehovah is I am. And it means the uncreated God. So imagine from the burning bush, Moses already shot this bush that's burning but not consumed. It's not like turning into ashes. It just continues to, to burn. And then he hears name I am. His, his knee should have gotten weak and just fall to, fallen to the ground because here is the uncreated God speaking to a creature. It's an amazing sight. But what we see is a glimpse of God's grace to open up his conversation with men once again. That was closed off, cut off since Adam sinned. So with Moses, um, God does this great work of bringing his people out of their slavery of how many years? For how many years? 430 years. Don't look at your sister. She's not going to tell you how many years. <laughs> 430 years. So for, for 430 years, for four generations, they had been slaves, e slaves in Egypt. But God sent Moses to bring them out. So when Moses, as an old man who had a stuttering problem and was a fugitive, wanted, a wanted guy in Egypt, going in with his staff and bringing them out, you could just imagine this one man bringing about 2 million of people out of their slavery for generations. This is an amazing sight. This was the success of Moses. He went in with the help of God by the word of God. And by the help of God, which is symbolized with his staff, he makes this great, great effort and succeeds. That was the exodus of Israel. Do you believe that? Amen. So when he brought them out, Moses then, uh, of, of course, under uh, God's uh, instruction, uh, brings, them into the brings them into the desert. And the desert is where God commanded them to build the tabernacle. The tabernacle uh, was also called the tent of meeting. Altogether, the tent of meeting. Once again, the tent of meeting. I know outside is freezing and you come here and all the body temperature and all the singing, all the calories, all the heat coming out. Now the only thing left is to just thaw. <laughs> thaw. Yeah. And the burning bush. Wow. Thaw. You know. But don't, don't be thawing too much because the fire of the Holy Spirit should consume all of us. Hallelujah. Keep burning. Keep, stay fired up. Hallelujah. So the tabernacle is called, what's the other name for the tabernacle? The tent of meeting. Exodus 28, 43. God said in Exodus 25, make a sanctuary for me so that I may dwell among Israel. So God told Moses in the desert, to build a sanctuary for the Lord so that the Lord may dwell among them. Of course, they knew, Moses knew, that God himself physically was not going to be inside, inside this confined space. However, it was going to be his name. Later we see in 1 King, uh, as uh, the King Solomon builds a temple of Jerusalem, it is the name of the Lord that was there. His promise to be there in the sanctuary, which is also called the Tent of Meeting. Why was it called the Tent of Meeting? Any, can anyone guess? Why was it called the Tent of Meeting? 
what kind of meeting was this? Like a business meeting among the priests or something or what? Who met with whom? God met with? With Israel. With Israel. Of course, the mediators were the priests. The, pri the priests were who, who they were. They met with God and the high priest uh, specifically spoke with God on behalf of the people. But God said, I may so that I may dwell among Israel, meaning so that I may speak with Israel. Build this temple, build this sanctuary and later temple. So this was a tent of meeting that was uh, that was set up, that was pitched as a tent uh, among the 12 tribes of Israel. So they pitched their um, tents uh, on the, each of the four sides, like a, like a box shape. And at, they had to leave certain space from the tent of the meeting. So when they would travel and they settle, they would you know, pitch their tents, um, three tribes on each four sides of that area. And they would all look uh, the, at the tent of meeting. Even though they were not able to enter there and only the priests were supposed to serve God there and only the high priest went in once a year to the most holy place to meet with God and speak with God, the people of Israel from the outside looking at the tent, tent of meeting knew that there was no other people on earth but them that God was speaking to. So think about the privilege, the sense of privilege that the Jews had and, and they still have to this day. So we see that throughout the history of uh, Israel, there were uh, those men of faith who really spoke with God and relied on God and succeeded. So starting with Moses, then continuing with David, they succeeded. So David was um, chosen to be the king after uh, the king Saul had failed God. Um, God had Samuel anoint David, even though he was not qualified in terms of age, he was so young. But uh, he becomes... Uh, king, but he then uh, is pursued by his own son, and he is met, met with enemies, and his life is just filled with battles. But one um, time in 1 Samuel 23, he's on the run still, and he needs to know whether he should attack the Philistines or not. Now, David was a warrior. I mean, you know the story of him killing the giant, right? Giant slayer? That was David. Yes. So David with the stones, right? Um, he, he threw that one stone and killed um, the giant and becomes a warrior. Like we see the seed of the fighter that he is, and he fought all his life. So we tend to think of him as this mighty warrior, but what really made him a successful warrior fighter was because he was very humble and always inquired of the Lord. So in 1 Samuel 23, he was about to go uh, and meet with, uh, uh, you know, attack these Philistines, but he said, I want to inquire of the Lord. I want to ask the Lord. So he asked the Lord, shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord answered him, go, attack the Philistines and save Kayla. So David, even though he was a warrior and he uh, knew his own strategy, he had them and to fight and to succeed, what he did was he trusted in God and physically, verbally asked the Lord, should I do this? So then he again in verse 4, once again David inquired of the Lord and the Lord answered him, go down to Kela for I am going to give the Philistines into your hand. So when he heard those words from the Lord, that's when he decided to go attack uh, the Philistine and, and, and engage in that uh, uh, warfare. So we see that David there, and of course that was uh, with the ephod that the priests wore that one of the men had taken when they were on the run. So they put the ephod on the ground because the way they believed was the, the garment that the high priest wore, the high priest was the one who spoke to God. Even as a king, you don't speak to God. The high priest spoke to God. Then he is the one who met with God on your behalf. So having this clothing with them, they put it in front, and that's how he inquired of the Lord. So we see that even though he was a king, he was very humble, and he confessed his weakness and his inabilities and his uh, lack of knowledge and asked the Lord. But what was the result? He succeeded, and in the end, he uh, uh, possessed the throne, and from there, he received the promise, according to God's pro uh, prophecy, that uh, the Messiah would come from the throne, the house of David. He was not the only one, but also another man named Daniel was also uh, known as a man of prayer. He risked his life to pray. Uh, in Daniel 6, he was... Uh, he had been uh, exiled to, to Babylon because that's when the people were exiled there. And then those um, young men who had potential to be leaders uh, were scouted. 
that's a positive word, but anyway, who was chosen by the king to live in the palace and be taught and to be groomed there. And Daniel was one of them. But um, because it was a foreign land, they were banned from praying to uh, other gods, uh, uh, and including the God of Israel. So this was to risk their life. And the king had to put a decree. Anyone who prays, meaning you Jews, if you pray, I'm going to throw you into lion's den and you'll be dead. So if you pray, you're going to get killed. Aren't you glad that nobody's telling us to do that now, that we come into a building in the dark, nobody's looking, but I'm praying, no one's going to come after us and kill us. Instead, it's us telling you to pray. <laughs> um, but back then, th there was a time where they were persecuted and killed for praying. And Daniel was certainly in that time. However, in chapter 6, verses 10 to 11, it describes Daniel. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. Daniel was a wise man. He was very talented, very successful, but even before, before that, he had been praying. And the reason why he became successful was because he prayed to God and he asked God's help. And he asked God's help at the risk of losing his life. And we know the rest of the story. He was thrown into the lion's den. But we know that the lions did not touch him. He survived because God protected him. So even after the dynasty had changed from the, uh, the reign of Darius to the, uh, the reign of Cyrus, uh, the Persian, so from the Babylonians, the Persian, uh, the, the, the monarchy changes, the power shifts. Uh, Daniel stayed successful, and he prospered. So this is why Daniel uh, is one of the favorite names that Christians give to their children. I don't know if there are any Daniels in this room, but you, maybe you want to change your name to Daniel. But Daniel was a very successful man because of his prayer and his faith in God. So the temple of Jerusalem later on, uh, symbolizing the house of prayer where they were to pray to God. This was where Israel prayed to the Lord God. So in 1 King 9, 3, the Lord said to uh, uh, Solomon, I have heard the prayer and plea you have made before me. I have consecrated this temple which you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Whose name was in the temple? The name? Jehovah. The name? Yahweh. So because of that name, if you come and pray, in the temple, around the temple, even towards the temple, you know, like Daniel. He was in a different country, but in the direction of Jerusalem, he prayed. All those prayers and pleas will be heard because the name of the Lord was in the temple. So this was very, very important to the Jews, even as they were exiled and taken as captives in foreign lands. So when the Son of God came to the world, walked on earth, and looked at the very same temple... And said what? That made them so upset. Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Jesus said, as in John 2, 19 says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. And this becomes a reason why the Jews and the high priest and the other priests uh, conspired to kill Jesus in Matthew 26. He said, uh, they, they ganged up against Jesus and they brought him to the Roman authorities and said, you said you're going to destroy the temple. How dare you? How blasphemous. This is blasphemy. You challenge God. Because the name of God was in the temple. This was the only place that they can meet with God, speak with God. So even if they lost their sovereignty as a nation, they would always have a house of prayer for them. That this was the only help and only hope they had. And here's Jesus, a mere man in the eyes of men, saying, destroy it. And on top of that, he said, in three days, I will be risen. He was talking about the temple of his body. Altogether, the temple of his body. Of his, body. his death. His, death. his Resurrection. Hallelujah. So what was he going to accomplish through his death and his resurrection? Now, again, thinking about the temple of Jerusalem, what was it? What did it have? It had the name Jehovah. And this was the place where God spoke with Israel. But here's the temple of God coming from the Father, from heaven. The temple of God coming with the name of God, the name of the Father. Which name? The name Yeshua. And now through his spirit, broken and torn body, he would open up once again the conversation between God and not just Israel, but 
all mankind, hallelujah, all souls of men, because that conversation, that relationship had been broken because of sin. But Jesus, through his death and his resurrection, he was now going to open up a conversation between God and all men so that they may come to him and seek his help to be successful once again. Of course, nobody understood this at the, at the time, and especially the Jews were so obsessed about the temple and what Jesus said about the temple that they did not understand. They did not even try to understand what Jesus was saying. Yet Jesus said in Mark eleven seventeen, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. So what is Jesus talking about? At the time he was going through the temple and he saw that people were selling things and this was like a market rather than the house of prayer for all nations, he made whip out of court and he started to flip the tables and just turn the whole place to chaos. And they were saying, oh, that man is like Hulk. He is just <laughs> taken by his wrath. You know? But then the disciples later, uh, my zeal has consumed. Zeal for uh, the, your house, and your temple has consumed me. So this, they remember that prophecy about being consumed by the zeal for the house of the Lord was about Yeshua, and because that's what he did. What he was saying is, you made it into den of robbers, but this is the house of prayer for all nations, not just the Jews, but a house of prayer for all nations, all together, a house of prayer for all nations. Can you turn to a neighbor and tell them, what is the house? Where's the house? What is? What is? What is? The temple. The temple was a house of prayer for all nations. This is where all nations are supposed to come to pray. Now, but then when you look at the prayer life of Jesus and see where he was praying, he didn't pray a lot in the temple. Instead, he prayed in other places, like out in the garden. And he, uh, per, uh, one example is prayed on the Mount of Olives. And in Luke 22, 39, it says, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. So it sounds like the disciples remember that Jesus had his favorite spot to pray, and he always prayed. He always prayed. So he went out, out as usual. At a certain time of the day, he always prayed. Early in the morning and late into the night, he prayed. And he prayed as usual. And he knelt down. In verse 41, it says, we, He withdrew, out, withdrew about a stone's throw behind the disciples, knelt down and prayed. So even though they were some you know, stone throw away from Jesus, the disciples, as they were falling asleep, if you remember the story, they were falling asleep when Jesus was praying, um, they still remember Jesus praying, and they remember how he prayed. And because it was so memorable, they wrote it down. Um, and in John 11, when Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus, after he had been dead already for days, um, he went before the tomb to raise this dead man. But before he calls Lazarus to rise, Jesus prays, looking up to heaven. And he said, Father, in John 11, 41, he said, and 40, to 44, Jesus said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I say this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. So before the miracle takes place, Jesus thanked the Father. Before any healing took place, before the dead man came out of the grave, Jesus thanked the Father already. He said, thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Now, who is Jesus that he prayed? Well, then he must have been like us, very weak, in the flesh, man. But Jesus is not just man, but he is God, the word that became flesh, the word who was with the Father in the beginning. In John 1 and 1, uh, describes that. He was the Word in the beginning. He is the incarnate Word. He is the incarnate Spirit. He is God who came in the flesh. So even though he was God, while he was in the flesh, he always prayed. So if you were to interview the disciples, his disciples, and say, what do you remember the most about Jesus? They could say, well, he raised a dead man or many dead people. 
He healed the sick. He, healed, he gave sight to the blind. He opened up the ears and the mouth, the deaf and the mute. He healed the lepers. Uh, he, he, he did all kinds of miracles. Yes, they can say that. But it sounds like more important than that, their impression of Jesus was, we remember him praying. And this is an irony because he is God. Why does he need to pray? Who is God? God is the uncreated one. He does not need anyone else's help. So if Jesus is God in the flesh, who became, who, he is the word that became flesh. He is God who came from the Father and became flesh. Even though he was in the flesh, he is God. Why does he need anyone's help? Because he was in the flesh. Let's go to Luke 11. 42 to 46. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven. 22, I'm sorry, it's 22, 42 to 46. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer, went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. So Jesus, when he prayed, and even, even though he is God, an angel came from heaven to help him. And when the angel came to help him, he was strengthened. And when he was strengthened, he was in anguish. And he prayed even more earnestly. So again, who is God? Who is Jesus? Jesus is the incarnate word. He is the incarnate God. In other words, he's God who came in the flesh. He is God, period. But when he was in the world, he was in the flesh that is like ours. And because of that, to do the will of the Father, he needed to pray. And he also did it to set an example for us. So just looking at this, I feel so guilty, you know. It's when we're tired, we fall asleep. Some people more often than others, and some people more deep, uh, some people deeper than others. It's a den of sleepers. It's not a den of robbers, but a den of sleepers. But anyway, so you come in and, you know, snoring all around. It's so tired, you know. They stay up all night praying, and sometimes they snore. And I go, oh, God, have mercy on them, mercy on them. Wake up, wake up. <laughs> but um, I understand because I doze off too. I fall, fall asleep too, and I'm really tired, of course. Not a, you know, all those hours I'm sitting, I'm like, bang, on, nonstop. You know, all those clear, ticket words with clear mind. When it's early, it's dark, and it's cold, it can happen. While the disciples, like us, sleeping, Jesus prayed in anguish, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground because he was praying so earnestly his tears and sweat dropping fell like drops of blood this is the model that he said for us men of flesh to pray earnestly in anguish like Jesus did why so that we will not fall into temptation so again, the disciples knew that Jesus was able to heal and raise the dead. On the other hand, they knew that Jesus always prayed. So this was puzzling for the disciples who had not received the Holy Spirit yet. It was such a puzzling thing for them. They knew that on the one hand, they were, that Jesus was a man of God because he did all these miracles and he has such wisdom to teach. But on the other hand, he was weak. He looked like he was weak as he was praying. Yet his prayer was so powerful and so moving that they made sure they wrote it down in the Bible. And by praying and finishing his prayer, he then was arrested and was led to the cross. And as his, his flesh tore and blood shed, he died. But when he died, Jesus said, it is finished. If you're willing, Father, let this cup pass me, but not my will, your will. This was the prayer that Jesus was making the night he was arrested. 
So he knew what was coming, and what was coming was the cross. And he was not praying, and he was not trying to get out of the situation where he would be dying. He was not afraid of death. It was not even the fear of the pains of death, but it was what it meant for him that he would have to, in his flesh, take on the sins of the world unto his body and be nailed to the cross with sins, with the curse of sin. What is the curse of sin? Death. And in life, failure. That's what God said to Adam. You will have to work the ground to eat and live. Yet when you try to work the ground, you won't have fruit. All you will have are thorns and thistles. All your work in vain. You think you'll have good life by working 10, 20, 30, 40 years of your life. But in the end, you're left with nothing. That's the life and the fate of a sinner. So Jesus knew that when he died on the cross, all the curse, all the sin, and the price of sin will be put on his flesh. That was the struggle that he had. Yet, not my will, but your will, Father. So the moment he died on the cross was when he laid down his life. He laid down his life, and he acknowledged that the Father alone is the self-existing God. The The Father alone can save him from death because Jesus, when he came to the world, he came to Hades. He came to the place of death. And the only one who can raise him up from this place of death, from this grave, is the Father alone. Where does it say that? Let's go quickly. Hebrews 5, verse 7. Hebrews 5, 7. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. How did Jesus pray and offer a petition? He did it with fervent cries and tears. Why does Jesus need to cry? Why does he need to pray? Because he was in the flesh, sent to do the will of the Father, to glorify the Father, to be successful at what he was sent to do, he had to pray. He, Jesus, had to pray. So he sent up prayers and petitions with his cries and tears because he acknowledged, Father, you alone are the uncreated one. Why did he need to do that? It's because in the beginning, in the spiritual heaven, a creature, an archangel said to himself, I will be like the Most High. I will challenge the only uncreated one, and I will be like him in the spiritual heaven. He challenged the throne, the name of God in the spiritual heaven. So for God to judge this creature, this created one. God waited by making the world and letting man sin and finally sent his son like a creation, like he was created, to die and set a precedent for all creation to follow, to fall at the feet of the uncreated God and honor him and submit to him. Hallelujah. So Jesus, through his death, condemned the divider who divided men from God by causing Adam to sin. And not just Adam, for all our lives we've been deceived to sin. And when we sin, we are set apart. We are cut off from God. That's the definition of sin, being separated, being cut off from God. And the source of sin is the devil. And Jesus, through his torn flesh and his poured out blood, he made a new and living way, as Hebrews 10, 19, 20 says, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. He made a way for sinners like you and me to go before the uncreated God, the self-existing God, and say, God, help me. Before, sinners could not go to God. That's why the high priest had to go, but he even himself was a sinner. That's why he had to give sacrifice for himself and for the people of Israel. Even so, it was only a shadow, as Hebrews constantly reminds us. But now, by taking away the source of sin and redeeming us of our sins by his torn flesh and his blood, Jesus made a way for us to go before God and seek his help. Hallelujah! So that we can say, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. 
My help comes from my Father in heaven who shed his blood for me. Hallelujah. That's why the Father then raised him up from the grave and Jesus sat on the throne. So the importance of the resurrection of Jesus is by rising from the grave, he proved that his death was not a failure. Instead, that his death was his success. Hallelujah. What is the success of Jesus? He died according to the will of the Father and gloried his name. Hallelujah. It was proven through his resurrection. And he ascended to heaven and sits on the throne, worthy to receive honor and glory and praise and power forever and ever. And from there he sent us the counselor, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in the name of Yeshua, the name of the Father, the name of God. And he comes inside, not the world, but to believers. Say amen if you believe in the name Yeshua. Do you believe that the name Yeshua is the name of the Father? That it is the name of God? Amen. Then John 1, 12 says, you have then received the right to become children of God. Hallelujah. So you have a Father in heaven. Amen. amen. Can you say together, our Father in heaven? Our Father, in heaven. Our Father in heaven. When you say that, it should, you should feel the Father's presence, the Father's existence. You should feel his help. Even if you're surrounded by hills and mountains of opposition and enemies and temptations, when you are on your knees and our Father in heaven, my Father, Suddenly, all things disappear. All problems disappear. With this fact alone, I have Father in heaven. Not by my might, but only by the precious blood. Because I have his precious name in me, he is my Father. Amen. Amen. That's when the Holy Spirit helps us with our weaknesses. Romans 8.26 says, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groan, groans. So the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of intercession. He intercedes for us. So does that mean that we don't pray at all? Holy Spirit, it's really cold outside. Do you mind going to the church and praying for me? I'll stay in bed. It's nice and toasty. You go. You go warm up the car. You go. You, you go. You go. That's not what it means. The Holy Spirit does not pray for us. But he lets us know what to pray for. He lets us know what to repent for. He lets us know what is the priority of our asking. You have the job. You need the family. All the stuff, needs and wants in your list. But the Holy Spirit, if he fills you up inside, he will tell you, pray for your soul. Pray that you do not lose the life inside your soul. Pray that you will run toward salvation. You pray that you'll not, you will not turn back to the world. Pray that you will overcome your temptations. He will let us know, even though we don't hear his voice in his silent, quiet groaning, he will let us know. That's what the Holy Spirit does. A Christian is therefore who uses this authority that he has in the name of the Father, the name Yeshua. In the past, it was in the temple. In the past, it was the temple of Jerusalem where the Jews would come back during their pilgrimage to pray and to offer up sacrifices. This was the place, the, the direction they would pray in because they, they, they believed that the name Yahweh would secure uh, their life and their prayer and all that. But we know that it was only a name of uh, the angel who came in, in the name of the Lord. But the name of God came with the Son of God, the God in the flesh. And it is the name Yeshua. Now we have become the temple of God ourselves, God's temple. Do you believe that you have become God's temple? What made you God's temple? It's the name Yeshua, the name of God that is in you, which came because you, the blood of Yeshua, washed and cleansed your soul, your spirit. Hallelujah. So why do you tell us to keep on coming to church and pray? 
because Jesus said in Matthew 18, 18 to 20, ask whatever. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loose in heaven. Where two or three gather in my name, there I will be with them. Where is the place two or three gather in the name Yeshua? It's the church. It's the church that gathers us in his name. The greater the power when we pray together. So we pray together in service. We pray together in prayer service. We pray together in home group meetings. But we also pray, even though we're not together, holding hands and praying next to each other in the house of the prayer, the house of prayer for all nations now is the church, the body of Christ, where his name is. And we come together to pray and pray because we have this authority because Jesus commanded us to pray. John 14, 13, Jesus also reminded, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You need health? Pray in my name. And when healing comes, you will give glory to the Father. You need a job? Pray. Because when the job comes, you will glorify his name. You have a problem? Pray. Ask. Then he will receive glory. So Jesus himself commanded, but before he commanded, he himself prayed. Again, even though he is not man sinner like us, even though he is God, because he experienced the same flesh, he knows how we are formed. As Psalm says, you know how we are formed, Lord. We are formed of the dust of ground. We are weak, prone to fall. It was like I, I get so many of my fingers get so dried in winter because I wash my hands so much and they crack and bleed. And I sliced my finger of cutting bagel this week. And I'm just like my hands are all cut and they hurt. You know, it's like little cuts. And I imagine like people who get their limbs cut off. I don't know what their pains are like. And I go, I don't know what the pains of the cross are. I think getting, slicing my finger, you know, with a knife hurts this much. I don't know what the pains of the cross would be like. But my Lord endured them because he prayed. You cut your finger, it hurts. You fall, it hurts. You get sick, it hurts. It reminds us how weak we are. But if we don't pray, we are not acknowledging that Jesus, Yeshua, is the self-existing one. Only when we are on our knees praying, we acknowledge that Yeshua, my Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, you alone are the uncreated one. I am created. I cannot live on my own. I need your help. I remember many years ago I heard this preaching, and I was shocked. If I don't pray, it means I am challenging God. I never thought that. Oh, you know, if I don't pray, then I was lazy, I was tired, I didn't pray, or whatever. I was busy. But that's not what it means. If you don't pray, you're saying, I'm going to live on my own. I lived yesterday on my own. I'll live today on my own. It will be OK. I don't need God's help. I got my own two fists. I got my own brain. I got my own education. I got my own car. I'm OK. You make yourself a god. You make yourself the self-existing one. That's what Satan did. When I heard that, I was shocked. And I vowed to pray from then on. That's why Jesus said in Mark 9, when the father brought the child and said, Disci your disciples, Jesus, could not drive out demons from my boy. He is foaming in the mouth. He's falling all the time. And he's having this, uh, you know, episode. He's having all this uh, thing. And they couldn't help us. Help me. Please, if you can do anything, help us. Then Jesus repeated him and said, if you can, if you can. And he, what he was saying was, you're telling me if I can? Do you know who I am? I am the almighty God. I am the one who spoke to Moses. I am the one who helped David. I am the one who helped da Daniel. I am the one who spoke to Israel. I am the God who came in the flesh. And everything is possible for the one who believes. And God blessed that man. He caught it on, caught on right away and said, Oh, Lord, 
please help me to overcome my unbelief. I want to believe you, but I don't have faith. Help me. Then Jesus drove out demons from the boy, and the boy was set free from this, these demons and this disease. Do you believe that? Yeah. Then the disciples, embarrassed, amazed, and then embarrassed, said to Jesus privately, Jesus, what happened? What did we do wrong? How come it didn't work on us? And Jesus said, this kind can only come out by prayer. If Jesus said, it's because I'm God and you're a man, you can't do it, then we will never be able to do it. But Jesus said, you can do it, but you have to pray. So the man of the Holy Spirit, the true Christian, is he always prays, never gives up on prayer to overcome, and then finally he is successful as a result. John 14, 12, 13, Jesus said, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. You will do exactly what I'm doing, driving on demons and healing the sick, teaching and preaching. You will do even greater things in my name. Do you believe that? This is success. To do whatever Jesus did, because what he did, he succeeded in. We must never give up. The Bible constantly reminds us, Jesus also said in Luke 18, 1, always pray and not give up. Because he knows. He knows that it's easier for us to give up than continue to pray. Jesus said, pray, always pray, and not give up. Luke 21, 36, Jesus says, be always on the watch and pray. Always on the watch and pray. Ephesians 6, 18, Paul said, and pray in the spirit on all occasions. Always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Whatever we do in his name, whether it's prayer, it's his work, it's whether it is serving him, small or big, or even anything, our personal needs, jobs, family issues, social issues, health-wise, we need to succeed. And that is only done through the prayer in his name, amen. If you don't believe it, ask him to give you faith. Father, help me overcome my unbelief. Not praying is not breathing, and even further in 1 Samuel 2, 12, 23, not praying is sin. Whatever excuse you might have, and if you stop praying, you're sinning against God. It is to fall on your knees and say, I need your help. You are my help. You are my strength. You are my shield. You are my help. You alone are my help. Help comes only from you. Even though the prayer is difficult, it is a burden, and it's rigorous, and it's training. If we didn't have prayer, I don't know how we would live. The fact that I can tell him everything is grace and it's mercy. I can tell him what I've done, and he will not judge me. I could tell him what others have done. These people hurt me. They said this. They're not listening. They're challenging. They have complained. They're resentful. They're disobedient. I'm sick of them. I pray to him. Then he gives me peace. He humbles me. Remember, you're a sinner, too. Amen. I'm a sinner, and I repent. I confess, I weep, I groan, then I have peace. Then I can live another day. Do not give up. Do not be discouraged. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Think of Jesus. Look at his life. You know, more and more, I think, especially this year, I think last year was so challenging, and starting the new year was so challenging, too. So I said, I'm going to look at Jesus. I'm going to only look at Jesus. I'm not going to look at people. I'm going to look at Jesus. And it just tears well up in my heart. He never fails me. He never disappoints me. He is my perfect role model. If he prayed, I have to pray. Even though he is God, he prayed. All the more I need to pray. If you have been given a position to lead souls, you have to pray so you don't lose a soul. Instead, that you will succeed as a group leader and that your group will prosper and bless and be blessed and multiply. You have to pray. 
You have to be filled with the ambition to succeed in his name through prayer. And he will then give you fruit. He will give you success. But it starts with prayer. Let us pray now. Please close your eyes and even for these few minutes, think deeply and ask yourself, do I need God's help? And I sure hope your answer is yes. Yes, yes, yes. Of course I do. Even if your life may be almost perfect, if you don't have faith in him, you surely need his help. But on top of that, you have so many needs, but you can't pray. You are too weak to overcome your laziness. Too many excuses. Ask him to help you to overcome your flesh the weakness, the laziness of your flesh. Lord, help me. Father, help me. My help comes from you alone, and I bow to no other but you. For you alone are the uncreated one, and I am so created. I need you. Let's lift up our hands to the throne where our Father has gone before us and call on his name, Yeshua! Yeshua! Pray again, who do you depend on? Do you depend on your parents and your sibling, your family? Do you depend on your friends? Give enough time and they will disappoint you and you will disappoint them. The only one you ought to depend on is the Father in heaven. He alone, he alone can help us. We must be filled with his name and filled with the thoughts of him and his life. Pray like him, be humble like him, and depend on him. Pray again, Yeshua.
Father, to be perfect, which we can never be. What we ought to pray and wish for each other is to be a man of prayer, a woman of prayer, to overcome one's weakness. For the Father knows how weak we are. He knows our troubles. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our failure. But he wants us to resolve to succeed this year by prayer. So let's pray that all our brothers and sisters here can be successful through prayer, that we will live by his help alone.